Thanks very much, Roly, for getting us started with such a lovely piece of music. <clears throat> Good morning, I'm Richard Schramm, uh, uh, and uh, the service coordinator today, your guide to what's gonna unfold in the next hour or so. Welcome to this caring, sharing community on this lovely Sunday, July 17th. Whoever you are, we welcome you. Wherever you come from, we welcome you. Whomever you love, we welcome you. Welcome to the North University Chapel Society, the North Chapel, where we aspire to be a congregation that nurtures the growth and supports the needs of its members, sustains a strong spiritual life within a loving community, church community, and seeks to have a positive impact on the world around us. Uh, a special welcome to those who are visiting. If anybody is visiting who would, who would like to stand up, say who they are and where they're from, we'd love that. Okay, if you're still a visitor but not speaking up, uh, please, uh, if you can, sign the guest book at the back of the sanctuary. Um, I'd like to ask you all to turn off your cell phones. And uh, we will, we're still operating under COVID restrictions, masking, social distancing beyond your household, no choir, and singing quietly. We've had some pretty bold singing, and uh, we'd appreciate it if you kind of soften it up a little bit. That'd be very nice. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, Peg Brightman asked me to tell you that the Ukraine fundraiser, when you take the money from the fundraiser that pledges to it, and you add in a small amount of money from the sale of pins, where we raised over three thousand dollars. Uh, <laughs> this will go to the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, committee which is working with Ukrainian ref refugees. The Amazing Grays meet online today at, at one o'clock. Our topic is the role of elders. If you'd like to join us, please give me your email address after the service. I'll send you the session plan and the Zoom invite. Um, you can see the uh, order of service and the website for other announcements. Leon's reflection today is called Grace Part One. He writes, Christianity defines grace as a spontaneous, unmerited gift of divine favor in the salvation of sinners. Grace is the divine influence operating in individuals, the influence that leads us to sanctity. But what should we do when we get there? What should we do with the gifts that we don't deserve but receive anyway? How is grace meaningful in these times? In preparing these opening words, I realized I didn't know a lot about grace, and I better do some homework. What is grace? Where does it come from, and how do we experience it? How do we experience it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, here's what I came up with, just from my own perspective. This, this is just ruminations. And if you know Peter, I would call them ruminations. <laughs> um, I start with Leon's uh, starting definition, the spontaneous unmerited gift of divine favor in the salvation of sinners. This is truly captured in the first verse of Amazing Grace, as you, I'm sure, recall. Amazing Grace, I, I said Amazing Grace, I meant Amazing Grace. <laughs> uh, amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. This seems to be a transformational experience from the receipt of grace divine influence to change my life. Kind of a big deal. It does, however, seem to involve some actions on my part beyond my basic wretchedness. As Rumi writes, you are so weak, give up to grace. The ocean takes care of each wave till it gets to shore. You need more help than you know. You have to give up to grace. Let the ocean take care of me, the wave, until I get to shore. This sounds like you have to accept some form of religion or set of beliefs in order to receive grace, like accepting Jesus as my savior, something like that, I'm not sure. This would be difficult for this you you -er. But perhaps we can give ourselves up to other sources of grace without the religious 
commitments and perhaps without necessarily changing our lives. Denise Levertov describes an all surrounding grace provided by the embrace of a creator spirit that may make room for the many interpretations we love as you viewers, uh, sort of like the spirit of life. She writes, as swimmers dare to lie, to lie face to the sky and water bears them, as hawks rest upon air and air sustains them, so would I learn to attain free fall and float into creator spirit's deep embrace, knowing no efforts earns that all surrounding grace. Finally, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Roberts describes grace as moments of illumination. That opens up a wide range of sources of grace. She writes, each of us is blessed with moments of grace, moments when our soul becomes clear and quiet, our worrying stops, our yearning and planning and waiting for fulfillment stops. There's nothing to be done since everything is already happening. Grace uncovers a mysterious essence that unites us with all being. That sounds pretty good to me. She goes on, who can say what ignites these moments of illumination? This is what makes grace amazing. It's beyond our control. And she goes on to say, it comes when we free ourselves of the illusion that we are in charge. Okay, so giving up to grace, according to Elizabeth Roberts, is sort of letting go. And, uh, and, and giving up this illusion that we're in, in charge. So grace is associated with moments of illumination beyond our control. That opens a lot of possibilities. Here's Mary Oliver's take in her poem at Blackwater, at Blackwater Pond. At Blackwater Pond, the tossed waters have settled after a night of rain. I dip my cupped hands, I drink a long time, it tastes like stone, leaves, fire. It falls cold in my body, waking the bones. I hear them deep inside me, whispering, oh, what is that beautiful thing that just happened? Those beautiful aha moments, the shock of a sunset's marvelous colors before we can put words to it. Nature is a source of grace, also art, music, even grace from one another. Peter Weimer writes, people who are grateful are more able to disperse grace to others. I'm guessing this means that those who are loving are able to provide grace for other people. So we can help, we can provide grace to one another. That's it. I like this idea that grace is available to us from many of our experiences if, all, if we are only open ourselves up to it. I once saw a documentary on a, a college professor, um, and he began the first day of class by lying down in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. And the students would come in and um, wonder what had happened to him. 
what was wrong with him and what was going on. And um, he would just rise and explain nothing and just being in class. <laughs> Which I appreciated. Uh, uh, and, and Richard, I wanted to say thank you. I can't remember what the exact quote was, but um, maybe it was Rumi who said that we are more spiritually needy than we know or something like that. Reminded me of a fortune cookie that I had at my last day of work in Boston. I was proud of myself. And um, they took me out for a celebratory lunch. <clears throat> and at the end of it, they passed out cookies and orange slices in Union Square. And uh, my fortune said, uh, go ahead and flaunt it. You're not that great. <laughs> I figured for grace part one, that's a good beginning. <clears throat> the same sun rises over all of us. Uh, it's really a question of whether or not we see it. Uh, good morning. I saw a, a grammar cartoon in the New Yorker recently. It featured two men uh, stranded on a sandy tropical island, uh, no more than 10 yards in diameter. There was one palm tree, it was a classic image. Uh, perhaps you can picture it in your mind. I'm uh, sure it's really terrible to be stranded on a desert island, but just imagine how bright the stars would be if you were. Just imagine the heavens. Might they seem near enough to touch? So I searched online for this cartoon uh, because I couldn't remember what the caption said and I wanted to share it with you precisely, but I couldn't find it. Uh, I found others though. Uh, I found a cartoon depicting uh, one man stranded on a smaller desert island. Once again, there was one palm tree. Now this man was bearded, he was dressed in a loincloth, presumably that was what was left of his clothing. Uh, I had the feeling uh, that he had been there for some time. He was fit, he was barefooted, and he was standing upright reading the classic message in a bottle that he had just arrived. The bottle was visible, resting on the ground, a foot and a half behind the man. What a miracle that the message could actually find the man stranded at sea. Uh, the man, though, was unimpressed. He seemed disappointed with the message. And the caption of the cartoon read, Hey, I got your message. Just wanted you to know that you spelled desperately wrong. <laughs> Have you seen days like these? When it seems that the world can't get out of its own way enough to stay connected with that which really matters. Uh, we deserve to be connected like that, don't you think? You and I, we're entitled to as much. We get that, right? We're entitled to grace. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, it was fun to search for that other cartoon online, and I wish that I had found it. Uh, it featured two men stranded. Uh, this time, both of them were undeserving. Strangely, they were surrounded by plate after after-dinner plate, holding generous portions of mixed berry crumble cheese cakes and blueberry apple pies and strawberry rhubarb pound cakes and oatmeal cookies and peanut butter nut bars and dark chocolate macadamia nut wedges and ricotta cheese apricot croissants, mocha bars with almond glaze and lemon chiffon cakes with zesty peach dressing. Uh, icing, excuse me. Uh, these two men were absolutely deliriously gorging themselves on the sweetness of life, luckily, undeservedly, indulging in what they were not entitled to. And they were so very, very grateful uh, if memory serves, the caption read something like, I'm just so glad that the heavenly judges did not really know how to spell. Now, it would be clearer if this image, uh, if you could actually be looking at this image this morning, uh, it would be easier to know that the artist is drawing on the old familiar adage that says that in the arc of life, we can do what we please, but in the end, we get what we deserve. In other words, there is a fairness to life a measurable give and take, <clears throat> and in the end, we get our just desserts. But the almost karmic message was misspelled by the heavenly judges, and instead of receiving the perpetual penalty, 
instead of getting their just desserts with one S, uh, for the woes and for the troubles that these men caused to others in life, they received the perpetual reward. They got just desserts <laughs> with two S's. They got pies and cakes and mocha bars. Which of these is an example of grace? When I saw the dessert cartoon, uh, it got me going a little bit. I wondered about what we think that we deserve on our spiritual journeys. Uh, I wondered about what we believe we are entitled to. To deserve is to do something. It is to have or to show the proper qualities of being worthy of receiving either reward or punishment, usually punishment. To be entitled uh, is to be in possession of the legal right or the just claim to receive something as if by inheritance, acquisition, or exchange. Both words are transactional. Neither is subtle or beautiful enough to apply to the concept of grace. Grace comes without warning, without message. Grace comes without pride and without condition. It can't be lost and it can't be stolen. It can't be sold. It can't be purchased. The Beatles were right in 64 when they sang out with such passion, money can't buy me love, can't buy us grace, can't buy us happiness, can't buy us freedom, can't bring us joy. Money can't bring the heavens down to earth, grace can. Grace obeys no law of currency, it has no customers. Grace comes and grace goes as it does. It comes on its own, and it comes from the hand of God as if from the rising sun. It comes from the budding flower. If this is what we believe, grace comes through you and through me. Grace brings heaven down to earth. Dr. Jayan Cartel, uh, this is gonna be a tough name to say, Cartel Tepe, I think that's right. Dr. Jehan Karthel Tepe is an associate professor of physics and astronomy at the Rochester Institute of Technology. She's one of the scientists who is dutifully unpacking the vast quantities of data that NASA has been receiving through the James Webb Telescope. Um, what a fabulous mission. Those images are public now. They're publicly available. Uh, they are phenomenal uh, images from outer space. We are learning so much more about the universe. We are learning so much more about ourselves. In the context of all this new data, Dr. Carl Tal, see, I can't do it again. Carl Tal Tepe, Carl Tal Tepe, Carl Tal Tepe, Carl Tal Tepe. Don't screw it up in front of the congregation. Uh, in the context of this new data, Dr. Carl Tal Tepe said something uh, that was so interesting. She said, in thinking over the past year or the past couple of years, with so much going on in the world and with so much negativity, having the positivity of a mission like this to look forward to and something that is working and is successful is a symbol and is the symbol of people all over the world working together to achieve something that is technically amazing. To me, that's awe-inspiring and it gives me hope for the future of humanity. Uh, we are learning so much more about the universe and we are learning so much more about ourselves and what we are learning is changing us powerfully. I believe that we are learning about grace. Uh, a poet named Patty Carthcott, Cathcart asks, what are you waiting for? Believe in me. Isn't it love in this life that you need? And you can alter your soul on an altar of sacrifice, but give your heart to me. Let's bring heaven down here Let's bring heaven on down. I don't want to wait for the angels. Let's bring heaven down here. And that's what they're doing. They, being the scientists, Dr. Carl Teltepe and others on this project, they are bringing heaven down to earth. In a song that she released back in 1976, the year of the American bicentennial, Joni Mitchell shared these words. She wrote, at a highway service station over the month of June, there was a photograph of the earth taken coming back from the moon and you couldn't see a city 
on that mirrored bowling ball, or a forest, or a highway, or me here least of all. And you couldn't see these cold water restrooms or this baggage overload westbound and rolling, taking refuge in the roads. The framing is wonderful. The magnitude of that moment in space that still captivates the human imagination and the smallness and the finiteness that is irreducibly uh, uh, it, uh, humble. The, the image of a gas station restroom in the heartland somewhere where someone, an owner or a manager has thought to put a calendar over the porcelain, just in case, I guess, we become so weary of the road in our travels across the country that we forget what day it is. We can go to the bathroom and check. 1976. We were more amazed back then. We were more willing to be amazed. It sometimes seems like a darker time now, in spite of the fact that this whole life may seem a whole lot more amazing. Anyway, it was the son of a wealthy Tennessee cattle farmer who once explained that the picture that Joni Mitchell was talking about was very meaningful. He showed us the image of the earth. He showed us that photograph of the earth taking, com taken coming back from the moon. And he said, this was the first picture of the earth taken from outer space that any of us ever saw. It was taken on Christmas Eve in 1968 during the Apollo 8 mission. My name is Al Gore, he said. I used to be the next president of the United States. <laughs> and the laughter and the applause from the audience, uh, Al Gore responded to this. He said, I don't think that that's particularly funny. Uh, I wonder where we would be right now if things were different at the turn of the century, and wonder what would have unfolded after 9-11. I wonder if Barack Obama would have been elected. And I wonder if he would even run, if he would have even run for president. I wonder, uh, would the insurrection of January 6th have taken place back in 2021? I wonder about these things. But in any case, Al Gore continued. He explained that back in 1968, the crew from the Apollo 8 mission, quote, lost radio contact when they went around the dark side of the moon, and there was inevitably some suspense. And then when they came back into radio contact and they looked up, and they snapped a picture that exploded in the consciousness of humankind. It led to dramatic changes. Within 18 months, this picture had been the source of the beginning of the environmental movement. I think that we are in a similar moment right now. I hope that we are. And with a similar catalyst. This time, though, we are not looking back at ourselves. This time we are looking out at incredible distances, spectacularly far away. We are looking back in time through outer space. And something within us changes, something between us changes. Despite all the negativity in the world, something is awakening in us. Al Gore said you can look out at a river gently flowing by. And you can notice the leaves rustling in the wind and you hear the birds and you hear the tree frogs in the distance, you can hear a cow, and you can feel the grass, and the mud gives a little bit on the riverbank. It's quiet and peaceful, and all of a sudden, it's a gear shift inside of you. It's like a deep breath, and you can hear yourself saying, oh yeah, I almost forgot about all of that. This is the gesture of grace. It is surprising. We don't deserve it. We are not entitled to it. We cannot buy it. We cannot sell it. We cannot lose it. And it cannot be stolen away. It comes without warning or method. It comes without pride or condition. The gesture of grace surprises, bringing heaven down to earth. I was surprised when I was looking for the Desert Island cartoon and I was distracted for a while and I fell into a YouTube wormhole. Uh, I ended up coming across a show called Dismantling Racism is Patriotic. 
John Stewart talks with Senator Cory Booker. Uh, I shared the link with Richard Schramm earlier this week. Uh, in fact, I'd love to schedule a workshop with you on that, schedule, on that subject if you uh, choose to do that. And I'm sorry to ask you so coercively, but I'm, <laughs> I'm excited about it. Anyway, their exchange lasts about 90 minutes, and I found grace in the experience of watching them. Watching them, watching them. Uh, Senator Booker quoted a poem by a woman named Gwendolyn Brooks. Uh, it's a poem called Paul Robeson. Uh, the poem is named after the artist and intellectual, after the actor and groundbreaking athlete of the 20th century. Gwendolyn Brooks wrote these words. That time, we all heard it, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day, the major voice, the adult voice, foregoing rolling river, foregoing tearful tale of bale and barge, and the other, simple, sin, uh, the other symptoms of an old despond. Paul Robeson, if you remember, was highly acclaimed for his role as Joe in the musical called Showboat. Joe uh, was a black stevedore. Uh, like so many like him, he was a longshoreman and he worked the docks every day, but he had grown weary from the hard work. And he said, you and me, we sweat and strain, the body aching and racked with pain, tote that barge and lift that bale, get a little drunk and we land in jail. It is no wonder then that Joe becomes despondent, but something of grace shines through unexpectedly as the poetry of Gwendolyn Brooks continues. She said, warning in music words, devout and large, we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Through the storm and through the strife, we continue on together, so often against the odds and against the grain. Gwendolyn Brooks lived from 1917 to the turn of the century. Early poets mused about similar sentiments. They wrote and they declared, really, that we mutually pledge each other, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And they did so on the fourth day in July, back in 1776, 246 years, one week, and six days ago today, it was a, it was a Thursday. I don't know why, but it being, seems fitting somehow. Good morning and good Sunday. I hope that this new day finds you well. Today is July the 17th, and the title of this morning's reflection is Grace, Part 1, because grace is not the kind of subject that fits squarely within the boundaries of a single Sunday morning. So I will return to this subject in the future. It fascinates me so. Christianity defines grace as the spontaneous and unmerited gift of the divine favor and salvation of sinners. Grace is the divine influence operating in individuals. It is the influence that leads us to sanctity. But what should we do when we get there? There was a cartoon that I didn't uh, write about, um, which showed a, a road and, uh, uh, that forked with a signpost on it and went off in two different directions. On the one side, there were cars that were packed to the gills, you know, stuffed with all manner of clothing, toys, fishing rods, uh, uh, food, picnic tables, couches, stereo systems, instruments in and out of their cases and it was backed up for miles. And the sign uh, post that showed where that road was going read, workshop on heaven, best in the world, $100 a ticket, buy four, get the fifth one free. <laughs> and the road leading off to the right that had almost nobody on it, except a couple of people skipping merrily along their way said, road to heaven itself, priceless. What is it gonna take for us to get to heaven? Now, I won't spoil this documentary for you, um, but there was one thing that Cory Booker said that I thought was absolutely beautiful and brilliant. He recognized how much trouble, how much tension that we're up against. There's no need to rehearse those stories for you. 
But what he said that I thought was brilliant, what he said that I thought was graceful, was that there is a spiritual component, he says. There is a spiritual component that I have to return to, a spiritual component of empathy that is written into our founding documents. Now, the founding documents are full of uninvolved thoughts. Native Americans are called savages. In the founding documents, blacks are fractions of human beings. They don't even mention women. It's men. I understand all that, but there was a genius, he says. There was a genius in these documents that has inspired African Americans since the founding of this country to dream a bigger dream. There are, there's a genius that inspires all of us. Every leader, from Frederick Douglass to Martin Luther King, called on the documents of our founding as a way of calling to the consciousness a larger country. He said at the end of the Declaration of Independence, it's all about empathy. He says that it's, the document says, the Declaration of Independence says at its closing, that we must mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor if we do not do this, the whole thing is lost, he said. The great poet once said that we are each other's business, we are each other's harvest, we are each other's magnitude and bond. He says there is a time for politics, but there is a time for poetry as well. And that we need more the poets to awaken the larger vision of what is possible for us. In closing, the thing that touched me perhaps most was when John Stewart, in his humor and his bitterness, uh, said, why is it always incumbent upon the disenfranchised to show that kind of grace? Cory Booker said, it's not. It's incumbent on you and on me and on others. We all share that. We all share that load and that graceful gift. It's easy to forget that. Uh, it's easy to believe that we are a nation that is divided, but we are not. We are a people who, is, who are asked to be truly undivided beneath the lucky stars of heaven, stars that we see much more clearly now. We are asked to know that we are held whole and honored by a love that knows no bounds that we let no single heart from out the hole be gone from us. When we forget this, we are stranded as if alone on desert islands. But when we remember, and when we remember, so often grace surprises us. May it be that we are surprised and touched and loved and known and witnessed in our inward spiritual experiences and in the farthest reaches of outer space. May it be so. Blessed be and amen.